So if you look on a continuum, if, and today you'll see a lot of how do you restore a prairie, at one end of it you can have where you can just take seed and throw it in the ground. I mean, low labor, you have know, some productivity, and you can move to seed balls, you can move. When you get down to, to actually putting, making plugs, uh, intensive labor, but you know, great success on it. So we have found uh, in that time, probably at the end of this year, we've put in about, about 200,000 one gallon containers into in you know, different prairies. Sounds like a lot, but then when you start looking at a Texas City prairie that's 2,200 acres, you know, <laughs> I think it, 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 it's progress. So we're, we've made different steps going through, and, and, and time has been uh, probably the best. Uh, yeah, the best at by augering the ground. I'm sorry? When you say it's an auger like a post hole digger that you can put on the back of a tractor. So like if I said today we're going out to put some plants in here, take a shovel. I mean it's relatively we've had some moisture, but it, it would be a struggle. But if you put ten in the stronger might put 10 in in the morning, and that would be just about it. But if you can get it to be augered beforehand, and there's always difficulty yeah, on the auger size. Tom, what's the auger size? It is it a 6-inch auger now? Yeah, initially, we were using 8-inch. Well, well, that meant every time you dug a hole, then you had a plant to put in it. You had 2 inches around it to fill in. It was, it was kind of labor-intensive. And a lot of this goes on weekly. If you were to follow Tom or I or Jim around, you would see like Mondays, we're down at Galveston Island State Park putting in. The digging's a little easier there because it's sandy, but we're restoring that after Ike, and they're not all prairie, it's part prairie, part dunes. Tuesday, you could come here. We're here every Tuesday, or you can go out to uh, Sheldon Lake, where Tom has a team of more multi-chapter people that are working. Wednesday, we work wetland out at Sheldon. Thursday, we've kind of left out, but San Jacinto has work days out there. Tom's out there trying to restore that. Friday is Arm and Bayou, and that's, yeah, that's where we started off. Probably by the end of this year, we'll put in 100,000 one-gallon pots out there. It's in 2,500 acres, so you know, if you look out there, it isn't concentrated. You know, we've kind of moved to different areas. And usually the people we're using to, to do it are school groups, or it's like a pandemonium and a prairie planting. At each one of these sites, we've tried to get the public to come in and, and help put plants in. And then during... One point, excuse go me, ahead. Dick. Just go make ahead. one yeah. point. There's only half of the locations that we work at have an auger or a tractor. So an auger does not shut the operation down. It just makes it easier and faster and more efficient. Okay? I mean, a sharpshooter by far is still the best mechanism to put plants in the ground. It just takes a little bit more effort. <laughs> yeah, if you put me... <laughs> <laughs> you thought that was funny? <laughs> well, there was, a, no, there was a time I could put, you know, dig up this, you know, now I'm, I'm pretty much exclusively in the sprigging mode. I mean, that's the thing we've attempted to do with the master naturalists is to take the whole variety of strong looking people that can go out there and dig those holes to people that have to sit back here and get the plants ready for them. It's both are essential. You know, the alpha group, you need them. You have to put the plants in the ground. But it makes it easier if you've got a cooperation with the place where you can, can auger. But, it, you know, with every, all the cutbacks that are going on, it's difficult to find the time to, to do all of that. So, of the 200,000 or so of gallon plants that you've planted, what's the percentage of you you've, you've you Being rescued six, them from someplace else versus you've grown them from seed? Yeah, well, okay, I, I just kind of went over that quickly. Initially, we were rescuing. You know, we, were, we started at Spencer, and they said, you can have the plants. Uh, we weren't looking for seeds at the time, so we figured, let's go get the plants, bring them back. And I, as we continued through five, six years, then we started to, to rescue like along right of ways, you know, or railroad tracks and places. If, if in this area, if you ask, where can you find the seeds in the plants, 
there's quite a bit here still. If you go to the middle of the state, and we kind of gave a talk there, they said, where do you get the seeds? Because they have farmed every inch up there. Whereas this area hasn't been farmed as much as it's been grazed. So you can go along 45 and still see prairies, right, on, bordering on it. So there's still a lot of seed base and plants that are here. So if you say, we really want to do this, you know, the plants are here. And then part of the thing, what we're attempting to do, they've got a, a seed production facility here. But at Armour Bayou, basically, we, we, we call it a, like a living museum. We'll put the plants in, and then they'll seed. So now we have original seed base from the area. And you know, we're not going out to necessarily buy the seeds. To, you know, to but, answer your question, yeah. today, okay, as Dick said, when we started, everything was rescue, 100%. Today, less than 5% of us rescue. Okay, we've learned how to find the seeds, we've learned how to grow them, and it gives us much more availability and diversity than rescue. That doesn't say that we don't rescue, because in the middle of the winter time, when you're trying to get ready for that February, and you want to plant, rescue by far is the quickest mechanism to get the plants ready. Okay, germination. Just to give you an example, germination in January is 24 days for little blue stem. For June, it's four days. Okay, so everything slows down with temperature here in Texas. So if you want to plant ready for February and March, you've got to go to rescue and get it ready. If you've got time, definitely it's much less work to work from seeds, but it's much more time. Even in the middle of summer, Six weeks on rescue, the plant's ready to put in the ground. In the middle of summer, six months on seedlings, on seeding. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry, Dick. I'm no, you're, you're putting this together. Okay. Yeah. Go. Uh, just two. So you have to think, why are we doing this? What should we be doing? As you go through the day, the questions will be, for us, what's the best way to do it? Now, tall grass restoration handbook is one that, you know, if you're really going to get serious about it, you know, I go through it, read it, underline it, and, uh, and then there's a new one I just came across, Where the Sky Begins, Land of the Tall Grass Prairie, which gives a nice historical perspective to what's, what's going on. It shows, it starts off the geology that brought all the material so that you can have prairies and the difference in the plants and such. But at the end of it, it's got people that have attempted to, to grow prairies. One high school teacher started in 87, took some land around the school and said, I would like to create, and went through all of the things and what you shouldn't do. <laughs> and that's what you're going to probably pick up, that you're here interested in, in restoring what you have or creating some. And, and you've got to put that whole all those factors into the picture, like the master naturalist brought a ready source of volunteer free labor. Uh, highly intelligent, many of the people, myself excluded, but uh, you know, it, it came out and had a professional background and, and are good workers, they learned to work, you know, and a lot of them are older. So that kind of sped up, but you know, are we using the talent and time as effectively as we can. You know, like the Conservancy has so many hired people and such, so they're limited in what they can do. But uh, if you say, oh, we have a crew that may, like, it, how many do you have about it? At least a dozen out at Sheldon. Armand Bayou has about 20 coming out on Friday to work. And you get that many people that put that, their time in uh, something. So those will be some of the judgments here. So we'd like to show you a little of what we, what we do on here. I, I, uh, John Madsen. John Madsen. Whatever it is. Before you do that, can I ask one more question? Yes. Um, when we're planning, when you guys are planning these, are you putting them in uh, areas that have a significant percentage of native um, vegetation, or are, they, are you putting them in fields that have a low percentage, and does that have a bearing on success? Surprisingly, it does not. Okay. Right now we're working at San Jack. It is uh, Bermuda grass. Okay, and we're not doing anything. 
to it. No prep at all. Okay, put the plants in the ground. They will shade out the Bermuda grass over time and take it out. Okay. To answer your question, we basically do not have the ability to go in and prepare the ground. If we do anything at all, we mow everything down to 12 inches just so we can find out what we're doing. Okay. But that's how we prepare. If there's an auger, fine. So we don't worry about what else is out there. All right, because most of the plants that we're putting in the ground are not exactly babies. These are not four by fours that you're buying for your garden. This is what we're putting in the ground. Okay, and this is the level that the plants already started. Now, if I can, I'd like to start with this. You know, everybody asks me how long does this. How long does this survive out in the prairie with no water after we put it in? The answer to that question is about 12 weeks in the middle of Texas, if it's planted correctly. Planted correctly, and we have found and determined the protocol to put it in the ground. Okay, that's dramatically different than a 4x4, four four, which we learned very quickly was about four weeks. If you didn't get water on them, you lost the plant. The difference is, is, like I say, three months. This plant, when planted properly, will survive for 12 weeks without ever seeing water again. Pop, pop that on the pot, show I'm going to. Huh? I'm going to. Are there any specific plants that you should plant first in the prairie to make it, uh, like, hold the ground or something like that? Or are there, are there any order? Generally not. Okay, what we do is, depending on what the individual that owns the property wants us to do, Okay, we have a tendency to plant on either six foot or nine foot bases, and we plant everything that we've got available to us and let nature make the decisions. We don't make the decisions. Yes, if it's a, a wet spot, we'll put more gamma and switch in because they like wetter areas, or if it's a dry area, we'll put in more big blue and, and uh, yellow in the grass, but we'll put in everything and everywhere and let nature make the decisions. We don't try. How about you say everything is like <coughs> grasses, not forbs? Oh, sir, we plant as many forbs as we do grasses. Okay, we also, we started out as major tall grass prairies, the Texas Big Five. Big blue stem, little blue stem, switch grass, yellow Indian grass, and eastern gamma grass. Okay, we have more and more people are saying, I'm, that's good, but you know, we need shorter, smaller, areas um, and they don't want necessarily the tall grasses anymore and when I ask the question and please don't take this wrong because Harris County told me this you know there's one problem with tall grass prairies anybody know what that is they hide the bodies exactly they, you know it's a problem you know it's, so consequently we have more and more people that are asking us for diversity more golf muley more love grass more brown seed past palums, more Florida past palums, more open grasslands. We don't yep. stop with what we're normally doing, but we've incorporated more. Okay? As far as the Forbes are concerned, you know, we're pushing 30% on Forbes now. And that's dependent upon our ability to learn how to find the seeds and how to germinate them and how to get them ready. You know, half the Forbes, if you stop and think about it, and if I'm going the wrong direction, you stop me. If you stop and think about it, by June the plants are gone. Has anybody ever tried to find Habertia in July? <laughs> or Erect Baptisia? The plant's totally gone. It's not there. And unfortunately that same thing happens in this pot. Okay? Now, let me get back to where Dick took me. What makes this plant available or can live for 12 weeks? I mean, I want everybody to see this. Look at the root system on this. This is not a 4x4 four four with a little root down the bottom. These are well-established plants, okay? You dig a hole. Number one, this plant's got to be soaking wet when it goes out to the field to be planted. Let's talk about protocol. Soaking wet. I'm not talking about just wet in the first half inch. If you dump this out and it's not wet down here in the bottom, it's not ready to go in the ground. It's got to be soaking wet, dripping wet. We like to load them up on the trailers, fill them with water, and by the time we get out in the field, there should still be water on top of the plant. 
dig your hole, put a gallon of water in it, fill it up, and then put the plant in. Okay, now, I know where the questions are coming from. How do you get water out in the middle of the field? The answer is right over there. That's an IBC, International Bulk Container, 250 gallons. Put that on a trailer, put 100 gallons of water in it, and it'll go wherever your plants go. We get those donated from chemical companies. All you got to do is be a little bit more obvious and go ask them. Okay? They're only good, new, for three years. Okay? They got to destroy them. They will destroy them. Okay? They can't ship them. They've got dates right on the, on the containers. They destroy thousands of them every year. Okay? Go. Okay, I got a, a question about <clears throat> the soil you're using and what role it plays in the durability of these plants. Obviously, you're not using potting soil. Absolutely not. So, can you talk about what role the, the, the type of soil plays in durability once you get them out in the field? Okay, this is defined as sandy loam soil. We buy it at all of the locations around Houston. We, we obviously do this at five or six locations, so it's not all one location. Okay, it has a tendency sometimes to be a little bit more sandy. And what it does to you is very quickly, if this pot was all miracle grow, you can't water it enough in 24 hours to keep it wet in the middle of a Texas summer. You can't do it. We had a young lady from uh, Moody Gardens that potted up some in potting soil for us. I'm sorry. Potted it up. You know, we couldn't get the plant to survive. After six months, it was still And I says, you know, it's, something's wrong. So we put it into our soil and it immediately took off. Why? Because once these are wet, okay, wet all the way through, we usually water two to three times a week. Okay, not every day. Now, if you just water the quarter inch on top, guys, you know, that's not enough. You've got to soak them. It takes us a lot of time in the summertime to water these plants. Sandy loam soil is what you're seeing is right here in front of you. This is it. I mean, it's not miracle grow. Can you use that at any location, regardless of its soil type, or you would match it if you were going to? Or this is predominant. One of the things that we've learned is, is that each site gets their own dirt, okay. okay? We provide the plants, we provide the pots, we provide the energy. The site's got to buy the dirt. Okay. So as long as it doesn't give us a major problem, it's acceptable. And each one of them are different. Down at Galveston Island State Park, if, if we're planting on the beach side, we will mix a little sand in with it. But if we're planting on the other side, on the base side, we just use it. Am I taking too much time? No. We started with the soil here four or five years ago, and we got cheap soil, free, sand. All the plants died. It was just, then they thought, well, we'll do compost. Well, we were putting delicate roots into the compost, and they didn't do so well. I mean, it took them a while. It just can't be dirt. I mean, it really has to, like Tom says, some kind of good roll starts on. So, I mean, if you don't have ready access, this kind of soil, is there some place commercially you can get it? Yes, any of the, any of the um, dirt, uh, what do they call them, dirt yards, any one of them, if you ask for a sandy loam soil, you can usually get this. And you get about 100, about 320 one gallon pots of them. So we see I'm on a QB, if you get five QB cards and it's five times 300. So you can get we some normally order enough that the transfer to zero. It's usually five yards they won't charge you or up to eight yards. A standard truck is eight yards. Armand Bayou has buys it at 12 yards because we go through so much of it. And this time yes. It's I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Good. Good. So just that when you, when you get like that, in prairie plants, the roots actually go down maybe 15, 20 feet. So your critical point is, as Tom pointed out, is in summer, whenever time you plant them, if you get that those roots below 12 inches, then I'm from Michigan. A lot of the bulbs, you put bulbs in the fall here, they won't make it through the summer attacks. They're not much, they just burn out. Yes. Sorry. 
Uh, how long do you have to continue water? You said you have to water it twice a week. So for how long do you have to do that until you can just... Till they're put out in the field. Okay. Okay, once they're in the field, they're done. We don't ever go back and water again, ever. Okay. You can see some of the plants behind you and over here that we've been working on. Some of those are ready to go into the ground. And probably next week we'll start, they're going to start putting them back. We you plant know, as well as pot both at the same time. We will have four or five people go out with a, a load of plants and plant today, and there'll be four or five people working here at this table generating new plants. So what you see is kind of a staging area. You understand what I mean? You start with very young plants. Obviously, when they're this small, you got to water them and make sure until those roots really get going. Okay, but once they're in the field, we never go back. What's our success rate? Anybody want to take a shot? I'm sorry. She's asked me four times and I've missed her. I don't know how you evaluate success. Well, we can obviously, since we have some kind of a general layout wherever we're planting, we can go back a year later and see whether, well, yeah, there's a row there and a row there. You know, what we have found since we've used the procedure I just talked about, that we're better than 98%, and that includes 2009. And our revival, we've been doing uh, 35 transects for uh, spring and fall for over 12 years. To kind of, and some of the new plantings have overlapped into the, the old transects. You can kind of keep track of what's, you know, what, what is doing better when it's burnt and what's doing better when it's mowed. So we have been doing some monitoring. Is there, excuse me, is there an area that you have found that it just will not take the blue stem or uh, the gamma grasses due to clay? Some of the, me excuse me, yeah. some of the Mima mounds at Sheldon Lake, okay, are very high pH, very high. But we found that the plants survive, but they just don't look nearly as good as the ones around them, okay? So we've concentrated the plants that will take the higher pH, brown seed past palums, uh, some of the baptisias and things like that. But the only reason I know to answer that question is because Andy Sippix, who is head of Texas Parks and Wildlife Horticulture, he told me what the problem was. I didn't know. Okay, he told me it was a high pH. I cannot answer the high pH. All I can answer is that in this area, just a couple miles away, we have a plate of nothing except gray, bright, or white clay. And it seems like that ground won't grow anything except weeds. Uh, Have you sent some of it to Texas A&M to, to get an analysis? It's only like ten dollars or so, yeah. and they'll tell you what it needs. Well, okay. we, we kind of tried that. We put a lot of potash to it and a lot of <laughs> phosphorus to it. Uh, we didn't put any magnesium, but uh, and then we put the balanced fertilizer too, but it didn't. And we do seed balls, and we had two geologists, and we used red clay. And I had the question asked, why don't you use clay here, the white clay? The geologist said they just have too much acid in it. That's probably that seed balls are just going to kill the seeds. So you can't make to show how to put, yeah. put one if of I don't, in. If I don't get going, I'm going to get fired. Sorry that I haven't answered your question, but I don't know. But it, it, it is a problem in certain areas because we've seen it. Okay, there are two mechanisms we use to generate a plant like this. My first question is, does anybody know what this is? Would anybody like to take a shot at this? Tell me what you think this is. I've already told you I used the name. Uh -uh. That's what we're going to pot, but that's not this. This is switch. Everybody's paid attention to switchgrass, right? Yeah. Per acre, switchgrass will make more ethanol per acre than corn will. Everybody's heard that, right? No. no. It was on national news. <laughs> okay. Sorry, i got to play games. Two, two different sources of plants. One of them are right out of the greenhouse, and that's what we do with these kind of trays. Okay, this one happens to be yellow Indian grass. Okay, you can see there's multiple plants in there. The roots all go down to the bottom. And essentially all we do is put it in the pot. <laughs> 
how many seeds go in each of uh, the multiples? Well, okay. So it's like a handful. And... Well, I mean, I do this. Okay, I fill it up. The thing that confuses most people, how much dirt do you put on top of it? Guys, there's nobody out in the field out there putting dirt on the seeds that hit the ground. Okay, now I will say that I do a little bit once in a while, but most of the time I just lay the seeds down, put them in the greenhouse, and let them be watered. Okay, this is, this is yellow Indian grass, and this is a beautiful tray, and this is very typical of yellow Indian grass. Okay, there's probably an average of nine to ten seeds in each hole, and five or six of them came up, and meat went to maturity. Okay, sometimes if these are really heavy, we'll actually separate them in half. But normally, they just go in the pot. And they're dirt right up around it. Very, very simply. This is the easy part, so I'm not going to take a lot of time. Pat it down real good. Try Keep to put the, it in the center. Okay, very good. You beat me to it. Okay, when, you, when you start weeding, sometimes the, the grass is small, so you can have a plant in the center. Probably is All right, now critical this first watering of this plant needs to be massive. The water's got to run out the bottom because that's all dry soil. Okay, a lot of at KPC with those. I'm sorry. At KPC, when we get when we get to that stage, yeah, we have built little tubs that you fill with water, like you know, four inches deep. Super. And then you just set the suckers in. Super. Leave, Love it. Leave them for a few days. Pick them up. Super. Excellent. As long as you get it wet, I don't care how you do it. I really don't. Okay. Now the next one, I'm gonna probably Larry. You wanna give me a hand? And the people that are watering during the time. Hi. Now we talked a little bit about the uh, chickens um, that used to be here. Prairie chickens. Prairie chickens, right? Prairie chickens. Okay. Three years ago, Jim and I no. talked to the people. And this is your fault, Sandy. <laughs> Absolutely. We talked to the people, and they wanted to take to turn some of the prairie pens into native grasses. So we went in and planted for them. If anybody wants to turn something into a prairie, we'll help them. Okay, we'll provide the seeds, we'll provide anything that's necessary. I bet you Jim's coming over here telling me I'm talking to them. Switch groups. They're going to switch groups on us. Okay, give me two more minutes. Two. Well, maybe five. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, we, we planted them and we had actually forgotten about how good chicken manure is as far as the fertilizer is concerned. It's one of the hottest <coughs> nitrogen fertilizers in the world, 50% so, okay? Two years later, this is one of our plants. Now this is not normal. Please don't look at it that way. <laughs> Larry, you want to cut this up for me and give me a chunk, please? Because I'm taking way too long. Would you mind? No. <coughs> and I'll just move over here and keep talking. Okay? That's where these came from. They said, you know, we really appreciate your help. We can get some of this stuff out of here. So we don't ever throw anything away. So this was dug Wednesday. Ends. Okay, but this is not typical on two years growth. Thank you. Not typical on two years growth. Okay, the other thing. Normally what we do is the first thing we do is cut all this off. Okay, because we don't want anybody to get their eye stuck, uh, and it's much easier to handle, and we probably don't have anything. But anyway, can you cut that for me? I can try. Right, go ahead. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, sir. There you go. This is very, very typical of what we do, and believe it or not, it's not an awful lot different than what you just saw me do. I'm sorry. I have a tendency to be messy. I don't like to fill these pots up because if you fill them up too much, you can't get the water on them. So I normally never get them fuller than, you know, an inch down. This is the plant. If you notice the plant is growing from the outside, this is very typical of a rhizome. And this is all you need. Okay, get all of the roots under the soil. Don't. Any roots outside will dry up and kill a plant, whether it's one of these or one of these. All roots underneath the soil surface. Fill it up. Press it like we did before. 
set it out and water the living tar out of it. Okay, now I've taken way too much time. Grass? I'm sorry? No, this is eastern gamma grass. How do I know that? Look at the seed heads. This is in the corn family. See the corn? Yeah. Looks like corn. I'm sorry, Jim. Uh, I, we got to run. 95% um, of this seed is taken by the birds long before you ever get it. Okay? That's why this, this method of rescue is much better, and we produce 99% of our gamma grass from, uh, from rescue. Hey, Tom, before we leave, can I ask two questions? Oh, no. Jim will shoot me. I have one question and one comment. Okay. My comment, guys, Thank is you. if you want to learn growing plants, the Tom Solomon, Dick Benoit, Jim Duran way, we have a full series of videos that start from seeding to bumping up to division to planting and planting in the field, all on prairiepartner.org. They're all there. Or you can come to any of the locations and volunteer for three hours, yeah. and you'll get it all. <laughs> now, one one, one question before these guys take off is what scale are you working at in terms of the preserves that you're working on? These aren't small preserves and this has been valuable. So what are the size of the prairie patches that you're working on for this method? Depending on the number of people that we have volunteer, you know, we are the smallest area that we're covering right now is San Jack because we have six people, six to seven people. We're running about two and a half acres a year. Okay, Arm and Bayou, we run 35 to 40 acres a year. I'm not sure what Jim's doing here. I really don't know. At Sheldon, we're going to probably push Arm and out of first place this year. We're going to go over 40, I believe. Okay, but we don't do most of the planting. We do a little of it. But the big events, you see this shirt? There's a couple of young ladies with shirts on. We had 120 people out at Sheldon. <laughs> Pardon me. Saturday morning, including U of H people, and they put 3,250 plants in the ground for three hours. Now, there was a lot of logistics to do that, a lot of preparation, but that's the way it gets numbers up real high. Gotta go. Sorry. I don't know. Has anybody ever done prairie restoration activity? Show of hands. Uh, some have, some have not. Okay. Uh, you got to see some planting of what we call rescue. And I guess Tom told you that we got those gamma plants from the Atwater Prairie Chicken cages at the Johnson Space Center. You'll see why they're so big is because chickens tend to take care of business and the business they leave behind seems to really spark growth from the grasses. So you don't see grasses that tall anywhere. You do see them at NASA. Maybe NASA does everything bigger and better than anybody else. I don't know. I used to work there and I don't remember seeing anything that big. So anyway, what I'd like to show you now is when we do prairie restoration here, we pick our own seeds during the correct time of the year, and then we grow our seedlings in, in, in greenhouses. Did Tom tell you where our greenhouses are? No. No? Okay. Uh, we currently grow seedlings at the NASA Longhorn Project, at the University of Houston in Clear Lake, at the Clear Creek High School with the ADHD kids. They do some work for us. And we also stage them at Armand Bayou Nature Center. And we have just started a kind of greenhouse here. Now, we're not going to go over there. That's going to be the 10 minutes loss. But I can tell you, we're not using it like a greenhouse. We're using it only to stage the plants that we, that we put in the containers. So we're not really growing the plants, per se. What we have here is we have some of the grasses and blooming plants that we plant into the prairie. Now, along the main road, we like to put forbs in there. And forbs are the blooming plants that make the facility look good. Now, we have Tim O'Connell over here who makes the facility look very good, but we want it to look better than that. Raise your hand, Tim. Tim is a, Tim works here, by the way. He's with the Nature Conservancy. So anyway, yeah. So what we do is we bring the plants and we pot them here and we leave them here for a period of time and then when the conditions are right we'll go out into the prairie and plant them. What we have here is a tray of forbs. This is Texas coneflower. Texas coneflower has a yellow blossom about like that with a seed head in the middle. It looks kind of like a sombrero 
top. And so a lot of seeds, and we have planted tons of these out here. And then for the first time that I can remember, we're actually seeing some of these bloom this year. So when the plant blooms, drops the seed, we may have more. These are preannuals. They have a bulb on the bottom, so they will come out. And the seeds, any new plants that come from that is just plain extra. What we have here is yellow Indian grass. Now, it's hard to keep the grasses separate, so we came up with some tags. And so we call color this yellow because of yellow Indian grass. Now, did Tom tell you the, the five grasses of the tall grass prairie, so I don't have to go into that? This is switchgrass, and this is big blue stem. That's what it looks like when it's in the tray. Now, we have some other ones, but yeah. Yeah, well, well Tom doesn't like to use the blue stick, so he uses the green with a BBS on it. There's different, we usually have a tab like this that is blue that we stick in the big blue stem. But Tom, I guess, ran out, so he didn't have any. But a lot of the ones that I bring here are like that. And if it's switch grass, really there's no color for switch, so we just leave it white. Okay. And that way we can tell what the grasses are. Once the grasses get bigger, you can identify what they are. Now here's some of the grasses that we have been here. Some of these have been here three months, maybe even four. The first row over there is big blue stem, and you can see it's kind of healthy at the end. We have not been able to plant here very much. Uh, it was wet in the spring, but this facility, as I said, allows cattle to get into the planted area. It's a cattle rotation thing. So if we let the cattle go into the areas that have been planted, and they've just been planted, they go like this and they pull the plant out. So we have to let the plant in there a certain period of time, usually a couple of months, and so you got to coordinate your schedule with that. When the planting was good, the cattle were in there, and when the cattle moved out, it got real dry. And the dirt here is very difficult to dig, by the way. I, I can attest to that. We do all our digging with, uh, with sharpshooters and post hole diggers, depending on what the individual prefers. We've applied for a grant for, for an auger in a bit, and hopefully we'll find out next week whether we got it or not, and that'll really help. Uh, we, we've been needing one of them. Uh, the other grass that you see here, you'll see some switch grass, and there's some miscellaneous grasses. Anything that's not one of the top, any, any one of the five tall grass prairie grasses, we consider miscellaneous, like brown seed paspellum, Florida paspellum, purple top, uh, Louisiana rye. All of this we consider miscellaneous, and yes, we put them out in the prairie. Now, if we plant the tall grass prairie grasses and some of these other things, including forbs, out in the prairie, and we go away for 500 years and come back, what's going to be in the prairie are these five tall grass prairie grasses because they're your climax grasses, your dominant grasses that will pretty much push everything out. Now, the only thing that would stop that is if you ran cattle on them or put a parking lot on it or uh, if the tallow trees come in again. Tallow trees, they used to have quite a bit of tallow trees here, but the staff has done a marvelous job in getting rid of them. And they're not easy to do that, but they've done an excellent job getting rid of them. So anyway, this is what we have. And you can see we have some forbs. Now, <coughs> everything that we do here, we keep track of. We keep track of everything that we pot, whether it comes from seedlings or what we call rescue. You are seeing some rescue of gamma grasses. These are established plants that we cut up and plant. We keep track of that. We keep track of every plant by type that dies before it gets out in the prairie. And then we keep track of every plant that we take out into the prairie and plant. And we generate a report at the end of the year. We do that here. We do that at Armand Bayou, we do that at San Jacinto, we do that at Sheldon Lake State Park. So we have a good database with some experience behind it of what we're doing and what kind of works and what doesn't work. And so uh, based on the purging and the dying numbers, you can see if you're doing something that's not quite right. Now some of that is cost because it's going to be 110 degrees for about a month in a row. And so it's kind of hard to keep the plants going on something like that, even though you water them. Here we water three times a week and sometimes we'll sneak in an extra watering. We, 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 we volunteer here on Tuesdays, we water. Scott comes in, there he is. Scott comes in on Thursday and waters, and we have another master naturalist come in over the weekend, Saturday or Sunday, and she waters. Yes? Do you have any um, like weeding on, on the plant, like that? Do I have any wet? Do you collect the weeds at all? Or? Yes.
Yes, yes we do. Uh, yes. Now there's two schools of thought on that too. Tom likes to clip the top off and then plant them and I like to pull them out. So what I'll do is I'll get a little skewer and I'll dig around and pull them out. So before they go into the one gallon containers we pull out all the weeds. It gives the plant a better chance. Once the plant gets established those little weeds won't hurt it at all. Most of these are what you call greenhouse weeds because they grow because it's very damp and very wet. <clears throat> and so, but yeah, I'll, I like to, when people plant a tray that I bring, before it goes into the pot, it will be weeded. Now, the pots that you see here have been weeded because it, we haven't been able to plant, so of course the weeds are going to grow. And so we weed them. That's why they look real good right now. A month ago, they were full of weeds. And so the volunteers, instead of potting and doing stuff, they were weeding. And so the plants do look pretty good. Again, uh, it's a... Uh, it's a constant battle. You do want to put them into the ground as soon as you can, but again, not only do we have the dry weather here, we also have the cattle rotation that we got to be careful with. And I thought it's worked pretty well. Are you, don't you, huh? Oh yeah, okay, never mind. Tim? I thought the cattle rotation has worked pretty well. It's a uh, work in progress. We need some fine tuning, yeah. but it's, yeah, all has always been Like how many blue stem to put here and how many sweet cross to put there and how do you allocate them on when okay. you're taking them out? Yeah. Generally what we do, sometimes it's based on the number of plants that we have. And what we do is we lay them out in rows and then we just put them, put them out there like that. Uh, the section that we started working on on Tuesday, we've gone to something different here. What we've done is we've gone to medium clusters. And what that means is that we put the same kind of grass about a yard apart from each one of the plants with eight plants in each one of this little cluster. So when this grass grows, you're going to see a little bunch of yellow Indian grass, a bunch of big blue, and you're not going to see individual plants. And we're just doing that. We've done that at Armand Bayou, and I thought it's worked pretty good. And so we started doing that here on Tuesday. Uh, generally here, though, we plant the grasses about six feet apart, which is a lot tighter than what a lot of other places do. Generally, the grasses are nine foot centers, and 500 plants will generate an acre. Here, six feet apart, you need more than 600. You need, you, need more, you need more than 600 plants to generate an acre. And so our acreage numbers are down and our planting numbers are up for that very reason. The other thing is we have a seed production facility on the other side of the building and what that is is we are going to get into the business of providing plants and seeds to people that want to do restoration. And so we put plants, the rows are 30 inches apart, and the plants are two feet apart from one another. So that's very, very tight. And what we do is we're growing the plants there to actually generate either plants or seeds for someone that wants to do restoration, including ourselves. So, so is and, that gonna be available? Pardon me? How soon? Well, we had an accident the other day where the cultivator went in there and pulled, dug out about a dozen switch plants. And so we just picked them up, and that was our first actual rescue from the seed production facility. So now we're in business. But actually, I would like to run it until next year to see what it looks like. The other bad thing is that the way we do business in the greenhouses, we used to use fresh load of dirt for every tray that we use, and once we finished potting it, we dumped the dirt out. Well, times are tough, and so whenever a cell doesn't have a plant in it, we keep it and we reuse that dirt. But when you reuse that dirt, there's still some seeds in there, so that when you grow yellow Indian grass in this one tray, you're liable to have some other things in it. Over there, we like to have all yellow Indian grass in like six rows, all gamma in six rows. But if you look at the plants, some of them look like they're not what they're supposed to be. And they're not because of our practices. The other thing is that when we pick seeds, sometimes the, the people will be picking seeds and they'll, they're picking two different seeds and they'll forget which bag has what. So we get a combination of things. And so that happens a lot with yellow Indian grass and little blue where at one time we were bringing yellow Indian grass and it was 50% little blue. 
Now this facility does plant all five tall grass prairie grasses. We do support that. We have planted those in the seed production facility. And like I said, the only thing we've gotten out of that so far has been this accidental digging up where we got about 12 plants that we were able to do it. Are we almost out of time? I think you got three or four minutes. Yeah, okay. Minutes left we're okay, I want to, I just want to tell you that we do use the nursery over here, the greenhouse, for watering these guys. And what we do with the trays that we bring in here, we bring them from the other greenhouses, is when we have a activity plan on Tuesday and we run out of things to do, I don't like to send people home early. So we'll just put another couple of trays and pot some more. It's kind of like, it provides us a buffer because the, the, the people don't like to drive an hour over here and work an hour. They like to come over here and work all day. No, that's not it. Jim, can I ask you a question? I'm sorry, this gentleman has a question back here. In, in research or in, in studying of the history, are y'all looking at this place that was established under blue stem and it won't grow gamma, gamma grass or are you trying to put the grasses that used to grow 100 years ago back in the same place and is there is there a table for that for example again two miles from here which grass wouldn't grow but blue stem would and it wouldn't be the big maybe the blue we have seen that but we don't document that we haven't documented it. Our goal is to reintroduce the grasses into the prairie, and usually it's in combination. Uh, I have seen some areas where big blue does not do well. In fact, there's an area right here that we planted in 2009, I believe, and we put in quite a few big blue, and I don't see any big blue plants there. I'm not saying they're not there. I don't see them. Uh, we had a planting event at Armin Bayou and we planted some. You couldn't see anything. You couldn't see anything until three years later we had a little bit of rain and you saw what we planted there. And the area that we had planted that I was looking at had small clusters with five plants in each little area. And so you could see them. And that's why, I'm, uh, that's why I said if you want instant gratification in prairie restoration, you're generally not going to get it. Now I've seen an area at Armand Bayou also that we planted one fall and then a year later the big blue had 100 seed heads on it. They were this round, that big, but I have only seen that once. And that's not saying you can't have that in other places, I'm just saying that I haven't seen it. A lot of times you'll put the plants in the ground and you won't see anything that's going on for two or three years. And usually when you see it, it's because it's rained or if you burned. If you burn, it gets rid of all the old stuff and the grasses that we put in the ground are the first ones to come out. Because you can burn all you want, but the, the root under the ground doesn't get damaged. It will come right on out. And you can see the gamma circles. You can see all sending shoots. Because they don't mind any bit. You can also mow. And of course, kills a lot of the invasives, just like uh, just like burning. But burning gets rid of the thatch and all that other stuff too. And so it <coughs> it permits the sun to to hit the ground. And of course, with the ashes being black, it gets kind of warm. And if you have seeds, those those th that action will trigger your seeds to germinate. Uh, we had an area at, at Sheldon Lake State Park several years ago that we seeded like for five weeks in a row and we couldn't see a single plant that we could confirm and say, yeah, that's one of the ones that we seeded. And then they burned two years ago and our plants were there. So they were probably there real small that you couldn't see them, but once they burned it, there it is. And so they have burned here also, but I didn't, I, I didn't go and look to see if we could see any of the plants. But usually burning really helps our grasses. Some of those guys need actually to have a burn in order to germinate. Yeah. Not, yeah. It's, it's not necessarily true of, of a lot of plants, but there are prairie plants that they just wait until they get that extra phosphorus and all that good stuff in the ashes. They just sit there until that happens. Now I will tell you one, okay. Oh, I just had a quick question. Uh, who, who, who burns for you? 
Uh, they have a burning group. The Nature Conservancy is part of it, and they will bring professional firefighters here and burn. At Armand Bio, it's done by amateurs. They have a training class the first week in December, and you can become a burning person, and then you go out there and participate. They won't let you burn, but they'll let you put the flames out. <coughs> but, you know, that's... When you, when you can't start the fire, that's the second most important thing. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you ever try to schedule planning following the February burn? Coincide with spring rain? Generally, what we do is we do have scheduled plantings. We used to have one at the end of May and used to have one at the end of October. The one at the end of May didn't happen because the cattle were in the area. The one at the end of October or beginning of November, there's a chance we're going to have that. <clears throat> and we really need a planting event because we got 4,500 plants here. And the volunteers can only plant about 200 or 150 to 200. 200 every week. Yeah. <laughs> And the potters can double that when they get real busy. So, you know, you, you, you can't leave the plants too long in the pots or they'll start getting root bound. Is there any chance of one grass smothering out the other? Eventually it will, yes. Eventually it will if you have a dominant grass. Although the five dominant grasses are usually going to be there, but there there could occur in a long, long period of time where one grass will take over the whole thing. And again, the, the more durable ones, the, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But the way we plant, we think that the grasses are going to be there and they'll coexist.